Good evening, everyone. I'm going to ask folks if they can start to take their seats. We're waiting for a few people um, to get started, but I wanted to just, and I'll, I'll be a little repetitive just so folks know what we're going to try to accomplish today. Um, first of all, if you would like to speak um, during public comment or respond to any of the items or give feedback and you're not on a panel, there are yellow um, little pieces of paper in the back where Beth is, and she'll hold one up. And you can fill one out, and if you would like that, and then just put the number of the item you want to speak to, and we'll make sure we call you up. I only ask that you print, and for the doctors in the room, I mean you too, print. Um, and then the second thing is that um, for these hearings, we time all of the people who are presenting our speakers, and the reason we do that is to make sure that every speaker um, gets a chance to do their presentation, but also we want to make sure there's enough time for the public to get to speak and for my colleagues to get to give feedback um, to the topics. So please don't be offended. If the buzzer goes off, I'm going to ask you to stop talking. And the reason is that the timer will be up behind me, and that way people know that they can get to their, um, to get to their points. Um, the other thing I'll just share as people take their seats is that um, this, this uh, hearing is broken up into two parts. And the first part, we're going to dive into the, to, the, to the problem. And the second part, we'll talk about prevention. And the reason we broke it up that way is it's such a heavy topic that I also thought it would give everybody a chance to uh, absorb what we're learning and then be able to be a little more responsive on the prevention side. Um, so with that, what we're going to go ahead and do is we'll get started. I want to thank everyone very much for being here. And as uh, for a roll call, roll call, what we're going to do is just have people introduce themselves and also give you a chance to learn how to use the buttons in front of you. And so Sylvia, if I could start with you and then just let everybody introduce themselves. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Sylvia Arenas, and I'm a, a council member representing District 8, which is Evergreen area. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Eddie Garcia. I'm the police chief for the city of San Jose. Uh, good evening. Sherry Terrell, director of Children, Youth, and Family System of Care with Santa Clara County Behavioral Health Services Department. Good evening. Chief Executive Officer for Santa Clara Valley Medical Center, including O'Connor Hospital and St. Louis Hospital, Paul Lorenz. Hi, good evening, uh, Miguel Marquez, and I am the county's chief operating officer. Cindy Chavez, I'm a member of the Board of Supervisors, and I represent the downtown, the east side, and the southeast side of San Jose. Uh, Lori Smith, Sheriff's Office. Hi, Deborah Ryan, the presiding judge of the Superior Court. Jeff Rosen, district attorney. Good evening, Molly O'Neill, public defender. Casey Halkin, Director of the Victim Services Unit, a program of the District Attorney's Office. Good evening, Jolene Smith, CEO of First Five Santa Clara County. Thank you all very much for being here. So let me just give a couple minutes of background um, on the what we're trying to accomplish uh, tonight. And again, to thank everybody for joining us. And I know we're going to have a few more people uh, joining us here on the dais. But um, as many of you know, the, we're the Children's Family Seniors Committee, which I coached, uh, I guess I can't remember which one I chair or co-chair, but anyway, Dave is my partner in, um, in that, and he's on his way from a hearing. Um, but we have been doing a series of hearings as a way to gather information, use that information to come up with policy recommendations and move those policies through the Board of Supervisors. We've done that thus far around issues of domestic violence and sexual assault. Uh, many of you who are up here are also on our Human uh, Trafficking Commission. And really, it's a, a, these are tools for us to really listen to people and get information um, to my colleagues and then to get some solutions uh, moving forward. So to that end, when we did our hearing on sexual assault, one of the, the glaring challenges that we realized is that we were really speaking about um, young adults and, uh, and adults and really hadn't taken a dive into the issues of um, sexual predation relative to children. Uh, and I want to just say there, there are two people that really helped me focus on this and helped us put this uh, 
this program together for you today, and that is um, Dr. Um, Marlene Stroom, and you're going to get to hear her. She'll be our first speaker, and she just has such a drive and passion um, to protect children that, you know, really it's kind of almost by the force of her will that we are here. And then the other who's been an incredible champion for children and, and um, really led uh, with uh, Magdalena Carrasco is uh, at the City Council in San Jose is, has been um, Sylvia Arenas. And so after having a discussion with Sylvia um, and Marlene, we decided to convene the group so that we could take um, a deeper dive into this topic. So I, I just wanted to say a thank you. In um, April, we learned about the staggering and rising number of child sexual abuse cases, especially for children under the age of 11. The intent today is we're going to we're going to learn, um, we're going to gather information, and then what will happen is we, we may bring this back through our Children's Family Seniors Committee before we bring uh, recommendations into the board, to the board. So, um, what we're going to do is we're going to invite up our panelists um, to speak, and I'll just say to my colleagues again, I, I don't use the buzzer to be disrespectful or rude, it's really that we have so much material to get through and I want to make sure that everybody here hears enough of the, enough information to be able to, to ask not just good questions but to think about and work with all of you on good solutions. So with that I would like to, um, let me first say, are there any questions about what I just laid out or concerns about how we proceed? Okay. And um, and if I could, as people come in, could they just introduce themselves? Uh, so we have two council members that joined us. Magdalena Carrasco, council member for the city of San Jose. Maya Esparza, council member for the city of San Jose. Great. So, um, so with that, I want to invite our first uh, panel up. And if they're going to speak to the topic of child sexual abuse response and services in the county. So if I could ask them to come to the dais up here, if you're on that first panel. And if you don't know, I could, that'll be um, Dr. Stroom, Mary Ritter, actually Dr. Ritter, uh, Brian Anderson, Terry, James Gibbon Shapiro, and then I think Dan, you're coming in for Deborah. Tell her I hope she feels better. Um, and Cynthia Melkor and Andrew. Andrew, I apologize. If I say your last name, I'm going to just harm it in so many ways. I'm going to let you introduce yourself. And what I will ask is, as each one of you um, uh, speak, if you could just introduce yourself and give your background. And they all know the order they're speaking in. And we'll begin, um, doctor, doctors, to get us started. No. Try again. Just How about now? Perfect. Oh, very good. Hello. My name is Marlena Sturm. I serve as the medical director of the Center for Child Protection at Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. We provide forensic evaluations for children who may have been sexually or physically abused. I would like to thank all of you for your many years of support of our program and a special thanks to you, Supervisor Chavez, for your enduring efforts to protect all children and for inviting me to speak today. I would like to begin by telling you a story that is very close to me. About 100 years ago, a man and a woman emigrated from Russia to another frozen place, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, in the Canadian prairie, north of Montana. The, the Canadian government gave the family a piece of land but the man wasn't a farmer, and eventually he came to own a junkyard. He sold parts of old carts and bits of machinery and made just enough so that his family didn't starve through the Great Depression. He and his wife raised three sons in a small house behind, behind the junkyard. The boys climbed mountains of junk, dug around for discarded treasures, and came inside covered with filth and dust. The three boys, these children of immigrants, were ambitious, as children of immigrants often are. They studied hard and received scholarships to attend university. The brothers married, had children, and built successful careers. The youngest became a surgeon and moved to Los Angeles, where I grew up. His daughter is my oldest friend. When the three brothers were in their early 40s, the first brother died of a rare autoimmune disorder. A few years later, the second brother died of a rare form of cancer. 
Perhaps they were poisoned by toxins from the junkyard. Probably they were. My friend's father grieved for his brothers and ached for his young nieces and nephews who would grow up without a father. His middle brother had settled in Los Angeles also. So for a time, every Sunday, Holly's father packed his own kids into the station wagon, because it was the 60s, and drove to visit his sister-in-law and her seven children, who were ages six months to 17 years. Holly was five years old when her father began driving her to the valley to see her cousins. One day, her eldest cousin took her to a room at the back of the house and had sex with her. He was 16. To her, he looked big, like a grown-up. She was too young to understand what happened. She knew that it really hurt, and she was frightened. The room was dark and scary, these are her words, and no one knew they were there. He told her that if she said anything to anyone, he would kill her dog, Rocky. She believed he would do that. She also believed that if she talked about this bad thing, her father would die also, like his brothers. Her father continued to bring Holly and his sisters to his brother's house. Holly didn't want to go, but her father talked about how his children should have compassion for their cousins who had lost their father. The sexual assaults continued until Holly was almost seven. I called her last week to ask her permission to share her story with you. She agreed, and we both cried a little. I asked why her father stopped taking Holly and her sisters to his brother's house. She said she didn't remember exactly, but it wasn't because her parents realized what had happened to her. She thinks her father had a mundane argument with his sister-in-law. Holly became my best friend in high school. We both loved books, and she introduced me to her Russian piano teacher. Holly played Bach beautifully, much better than I could. She was more disciplined, and she practiced more. Mostly, she stayed home. I asked her to go to parties with me, normal teenager stuff. She always said no. I asked her to go out with my gang of theater friends to see midnight movies on Sunset Boulevard. She said no. She liked boys, but she wasn't interested in dating. When we were in our 20s, Holly developed panic attacks. I watched her bang her head against the dashboard in my car and wondered what was wrong with my dear friend. She lost time. She went to Berkeley, spent hours in the library studying, but couldn't remember what she read. She had a series of self-destructive relationships with men who didn't treat her well, including her first husband. I was in medical school and then in residency, but I still didn't understand. When we were 32, I went to visit Holly in London where her husband was working. One afternoon over tea in her kitchen, Holly told me the story of what happened to her. With the support of a talented therapist with a background in trauma, Holly had recovered some of the memories of those Sundays when she was five and six years old. Holly was calm that afternoon as she told me. She had already told her family. Her mother recalled that Holly changed around the time she started kindergarten. She became quieter, sadder. Her attentive parents never considered that something impossible had happened to her. One of her cousins, the abuser's sister, told Holly that he had sexually assaulted her also. Somehow this confirmation gave real comfort to my friend. Her, buried memory, her buried memories were authentic, and she was not the only one. Holly's story is one of resilience. Today she is married to a wonderful man and has raised two fine boys. When my children try to describe someone who is exceptionally kind, they say she's like Holly. The darkness has also followed her. She has struggled with anxiety and depression her whole life. Now in our 50s, Holly and I talk often about what it is to carry each other's history through our lives. Without question, I came to do this work because of my friend. She gave me permission to tell you her story today in hopes that our community will understand what happens to children before they have a voice to defend themselves. Holly's story, <coughs> Holly's story continues to teach me about the human tragedy of child sexual abuse. Child sexual abuse happens in every community and in every family, behind the doors of elegant homes and in single room apartments. Child sexual abuse is a crime of opportunity. Almost always, the child knows their abuser. 
a member of their family, a teacher, a coach. Typically, the abuser manipulates the child in order to protect access to the child. Sometimes the abuser threatens the child, as Holly's cousin did. More often, the abuser crooms the child, offering gifts and treats, and speaks to the child in the language of affection. Child victims of sexual abuse commonly do not disclose what happened to them until weeks, months, or years after the last sexual contact. Why? The child often has a close relationship with the abuser, a parent, grandparent, their mother's boyfriend. Sometimes the abuser supports the family financially. Many children, like Holly, do not have the language to explain what happened to them. Sometimes victims wait until they feel safe, until the abuser has left the home or until the youth is old enough to leave. Whenever a person discloses abuse, we have the responsibility to listen with open hearts and minds and to believe. Santa Clara Valley Medical Center has two programs that provide SART exams to victims of sexual assault. SART stands for Sexual Assault Response Team. The Adolescent and Adult Program provides SART exams to youth 12 years and older and adults. Our primary focus is younger children. Why 12? First, because in the state of California, youth older than 12 can sign consent for a SART exam. This is particularly important if the perpetrator is a family member. Second, girls go through puberty around 12 years old. Hormonal changes affect the anatomy and elasticity of the vaginal region. While a pelvic exam is never comfortable, youth and young adults can tolerate an internal speculum exam. By contrast, the pediatric SART evaluation does not include an internal exam. This explanation, which focuses on the female anatomy, does not take into account that 20% of our patients are boys. When do we perform a pediatric SART exam? Most of the time, 80% of the time, our evaluations are non-acute, days, weeks, or months after the last episode of sexual contact. If the exam is acute, less than five days after the last sexual contact, we can complete a forensic kit. About 20% of our exams are acute. We collect the child's clothing and obtain swabs from different locations for DNA evidence. For either kind of case, acute or non-acute, we test for sexually transmitted infections and examine the genital area for signs of trauma. Please remember this. It is never too late to perform a pediatric SART exam. So what happens at a pediatric SART evaluation? First, we play. <laughs> when the child and family arrive, we lead them to the playroom and introduce the child to an advocate from our partners, the YWCA and Community Solutions. Usually, the child spends 20 or 30 minutes playing with the advocate while we interview the parent. Next, we explain the exam to the child so they know what to expect. We perform a pediatric physical first, check mouth and ears, listen to heart and lungs, and look head to toe for bruises, abrasions, or other superficial injuries. Most children feel comfortable with a doctor's exam. This is nothing new. Then we explain that we will be using a colposcope a special magnifier with a light and camera to look at the child's private area. We demonstrate on Froggy, who is really good at stretching out his legs and bending his knees. Sometimes we ask the child if he or she would like to stand behind the colposcope to take a picture of Froggy. Most kids enjoy that. Sometimes we ask the child to click the button when we take photographs. After the exam is complete, we encourage the child and family to return to the playroom. The advocate provides information about counseling and other resources, and we say goodbye. We archive the electronic photographic images on an especially safe locked drive. Who are our patients? In recent years, we have seen a little over 100 children a year. Our patients are referred by DFCS, law enforcement, pediatricians and other providers, and the victim's parents. Again, 80% are girls, 20% are boys. We are currently restructuring our antiquated database to include more questions about gender and also more information about the identification of perpetrators. As this slide shows, we see patients of all ages, but more children under five years. 
In many cases, this is because these children are not old enough to disclose that someone touched them in their private area, are old, excuse me, are old enough to disclose that someone touched them in their private area, but not old enough to understand or describe the touching. This slide provides more data about the age distribution of our patients. Again, most of our patients are five years and younger. We do perform non-acute SART exams on youth 12 to 18 years or a little older. While we do not collect forensic evidence at these evaluations, we are able to, to test for pregnancy, test for and treat sexually transmitted infections, provide prophylaxis for HIV, and offer resources for advocacy and counseling. Please take a moment to consider this strong graphic. It reminds me that a child at any age or any gender can be a victim of sexual abuse and that tragically victims may become perpetrators. Too often we hear stories of a teenager, teenage survivor of abuse who abuses a school age child. What do we find? In a very small percentage of cases, just 3% in our database, we see evidence of anogenital trauma. In girls, we may see scarring or transections, which are deep tears of the hymen. The hymen is the tissue around the female vaginal opening. In girls or boys, we may see tears around the anus. But most of the time, pediatric SART exams are normal, 90% in our series. If most of our patients have normal findings on SART exam, why expend the energy and resources to perform pediatric SART exams? There are a lot of good reasons. We assess the child's safety. We assess the physical and mental well-being of the child. We treat for sexually transmitted infections and provide prophylaxis for HIV if indicated. We collect useful data and lab information. We provide the family with information, advocacy, and support. And perhaps most, most important of all, we reassure the family that the patient is healthy. Who pays for SART exams? According to the current model, the law enforcement agency where the child lives authorizes the exam and we bill the law enforcement agency. If law enforcement does not authorize an exam, we can offer a medical exam at Valley Health Center downtown and bill insurance. Children 12 years and older may request what's called an NIR exam, which stands for non-investigative report, a confidential examination paid for by law enforcement. Our patients do not qualify for an NIR exam. The Center for Child Protection is funded by Santa Clara Valley Medical Center. In Santa Clara County, a minority of children who may have been sexually abused are scheduled for a pediatric SART exam. This slide makes the plainest case for why we need a child advocacy center in Silicon Valley. By the numbers, at the Center for Child Protection, we see about 10 patients a month or 120 patients a year. The Child Interview Center, called the CIC in downtown San Jose, interviews between 30 and 40 children a month, 400 or more a year. The San Jose Police Department reports more than 700 cases of rape or child molest so far in 2019. And that's San Jose. We don't have numbers about the other 12 law enforcement agencies in Santa Clara County. This is our perspective, Mary and mine. <laughs> Not every child requires a SART examination. How every, however, every child who discloses abuse or the child's parent should have the choice. We envision that when the Child Advocacy Center opens, our case numbers will increase three or fourfold. Recommendations. Any child who has been abused or that child's parent should be offered the choice to have a pediatric SART medical evaluation. All children who may have been abused should be interviewed by a child forensic interviewer who has, rig rig who has, excuse me, who has received rigorous training and is peer reviewed. All children who may have been abused should have access to an advocate early in the investigation and throughout the investigation. Education and prevention efforts should target young children as well as teens. Most pediatric SART patients are under eight years old. The Child Advocacy Center model promotes collaboration between government and community agencies in a trauma-informed, child-centered environment. 
the establishment of a fully accredited child advocacy center will help our county realize these recommendations. Before I close, I would like to say a few words about my friend and colleague, Mary Ritter. Mary has provided pediatric SART evaluations for child victims in Santa Clara County, San Benito County, and Santa Cruz County for more than 30 years. Mary, it has been such a joy to work alongside you these last few years. You are so amazing. Thank, thank you. I'm, I'm going to um, just... I'm on uh, the last slide. You want me to finish? Or no, I'm going to let everybody look at that last slide. But I do want them to give you a round of applause to both you and Mary. You are both amazing. We, we are so blessed to have you in the county. Um, just a couple things. I wanted to acknowledge that Supervisor Cortezi um, has arrived, and I appreciate very much he's our co co lead on all of these issues. And I also just wanted to acknowledge that we have uh, members of Congresswoman Lofgren's staff, Sandra Soto um, and Ms. Duncan. And I'm going to say, Poi, I'm going to say your name wrong. I apologize very much for that. But I, but I do know how to say Alexandra. So I, I really appreciate all three of you being here today. Um, so I, I will just say this. I am going to be more direct with all of you around timing. She's special. None of the rest of us are. So um, if I could, I'm going to go to San Jose PD and let us get going. Good evening, <clears throat> Good evening committee members. My name is Lieutenant Brian Anderson with the San Jose Police Department Sexual Assaults Unit. The key points to take away from this presentation are since 2015, victimization of 288A lewd and lascivious, lascivious with under 14 years of age have been on the rise. <coughs> 288A has always been significantly higher than 261 PC rape in the last five years. We know that from the last April hearing, 80% of juvenile victims knew their offenders. As a result, since a majority of cases involve a known offender, this gives the implication that abuse has been occurring for several years. The majority age group, as you will see on the next slide, are mainly 12 to 14 years of age. Ultimately, evidence-based child forensic interviewing is of great importance in the collection of evidence. What should be known in today's presentation is that youth aged 12 to 14 ranked highest in victimization, followed by youth aged 9 to 11 and six to eight. Eighteen percent of the total victims fell in the zero to five year range. Hmm. Santa Clara County's first five cumulative risk factors map presented children in Santa Clara County who faced the greatest risk of poor developmental <coughs> outcomes from particular zip codes and were areas where children lived in environments with multiple risk factors. Within these zip codes, we found that the department's data the top five of the victims reported zip code of residence coincided with the top five zip codes from Santa Clara County's first five cumulative risk factors map over the five year period. Note that 2019 only measures up to October 31st. Emerging trends <clears throat> found that from around 2017 to 2018, we see a significant spike as much as double or triple the previous year in lewd and lascivious acts with children within particular <coughs> ages. These ages are 4, 6, 12, and 13 <coughs> years old. As a result, we list here several recommendations <coughs> by the department. Targeted outreach by age appropriateness and zip code for education and outreach. Continued support for the completion of a countywide <coughs> child advocacy center. County Office of Gender-Based Violence Prevention to spearhead ethnic-based agency development within community-based organizations <coughs> and ensure countywide training for law enforcement in the practice of the Thomas Lyon 10-step investigative interview as a child forensic interview technique. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant. Dan? Yeah, it's for everybody. Or I'm not sure who's next, so. Good 
Good evening, everyone. My name is Terry Harmon. I'm an assistant district attorney, and among the duties I have at the DA's office is that I oversee the sexual assault unit. I want to thank all of you for being here uh, tonight because one of the things about child sexual assault is it is something that is very often something that suffers in silence. And I think that the more that we talk about it and the more that we face some of the ugly truths around this uh, horrible situation for our children, the better we can be at devising opportunities to educate and I would love to say eradicate, but at least lessen the silence around this terrible issue. I'm gonna go over some general statistics and then some issues that pertain to the prosecution of these crimes. These statistics are based on cases that we received from San Jose PD. San Jose is by far the, the, the biggest agency in our county as it, as it relates to the receipt of police reports regarding sexual assault. This is some, some of the more shocking stats for some people, which is that the majority of sexual assault crimes that our office prosecutes involve child victims. That is the majority, closing in on 70%. Part of that, about 58% of that, involves actual touching of the victims, but close to 10% involves possession of child pornography, where of course those Children are re-victimized with every viewing and every publication of photographs. And then there's uh, another smaller percentage dealing with internet contact with minors, people trying to get minors to show up, have sex with them, or otherwise send pictures. So again, that's closing in on 70% of our cases involve some sort of crime against minors that is sexually related. Anytime you're talking about possession of child pornography, we just have to give a shout out to the uh, ICAC unit that's led by San Jose PD. They really do an outstanding job. Uh, our conviction rate on these cases is as close to 100% as any other case. So thank you to San Jose PD and the ICAC members. Looking at stats for the entire county, 41% of the child sex assault crimes that we prosecute involve children 10 and under. 67% involve 13 and under. Not surprising to a lot of people, the majority of our victims identify as female Beginning in 2020, we anticipate that in conjunction with the Department of Justice, we will also uh, have stats for those who identify as gender non-binary or transgender. When we prosecute a child sexual assault case, there are a lot of different factors that come into play. As <clears throat> Our medical experts have talked about the pediatric forensic SART is usually very important, but probably one of the most important things that we look at is the statement that the child gives when they're interviewed at our children's interview center. This is meant to be a multidisciplinary interview to prevent the number of times the child is asked about what happened to them and asked to describe what happened to them. Journal entries, certain memory anchors become very important. When a child is sexually assaulted by someone that they know, someone who has regular access to that child, a family member, mom's boyfriend, close family friend, it's really hard for that child to say it happened this time and this time and this time and this time because it happens so frequently, it's just part of their collective memory of this is what happened when I was a kid. So when, when we are tasked with prosecuting, we find that memory anchors and trying to narrow down when you went to this school, when you had this teacher, when you lived at this house can be very helpful in providing a time frame that fits within uh, the dates of the uh, crimes. The uh, relationship between the suspect and the victim is always 
important and if the suspect has prior sex offenses, uh, we are for the most part very successful in getting that in. Supervisor Chavez, I know we've exceeded our time. Um, uh, would you be able to give me one and a half to two minutes to summarize our progress in the Child Advocacy Center? Yes. Okay, thank you. But, right. but you so, know, in all seriousness, the reason I'm kind of strict about this is I want to hear from all of you too. So I'm giving you the hairy eyeball. No, I'm just kidding. Please no, go no, ahead. No, no, I'm going to talk fast. Okay. Okay. So um, in April, we were all here together talking about sexual assault. And it was a really important meeting on one, on lots of key issues, but the, for my mind, for the most important issue, it's already been talked about by Dr. Sturm, by Lieutenant Anderson, and it's gonna be referred to by multiple other speakers. Right now, we shuttle child victims for, to one location for child interviewing, a different location for SART exam, a different location for victim services. We want to build a child advocacy center to locate these all under one roof. And at the hearing we had in April, we established with all of you in the room a consensus to do just that. Dr. Smith, after that hearing, suggested this building, which is part of the O'Connor site, to house a child advocacy center. Three quarters of the first floor is vacant. Fleets and Facilities is working with the DA's office for a renovation cost estimate, which I'm hoping is gonna be done in the next few months. So what we need from you is to continue that momentum that we're all in this, that we all think this is a great idea whose time has come. Once we get that cost estimate for the renovation, hopefully we can all figure out together how we're going to renovate that site how we're going to um, plan it together, how we're going to implement it uh, together. And I'm hoping we can do that all within the next six to 12 months because we've been, wait we've been waiting a long time to have this come. And I will see the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I think Dan, this is you. And, thank and I just want you all to know Dan's stepping in because uh, Deborah's ill tonight. So is Dan, thank you. Is on. All right. Good afternoon. I'm Dan Little, I'm the Assistant Director with uh, Department of Family and Children's Services. So, to give a little background on um, the uh, our role in investigation. So, per the the Welfare and Institution Code, we investigate children who've been sexually abused um, to determine if there's is, if there is substantial risk that the child will be sexually abused, as defined in Section um, 11165.1 of the Penal Code by his or her parent or guardian or a member of his or her household, or the parent, parent or guardian has failed to adequately protect the child from sexual abuse when the parent or guardian knew or reasonably knew should have known that the child was in danger of sexual abuse. So there are, there are uh, a multitude of services that are accessed through our, um, through our provider network. Um, and part of those services include case management. Um, there's counseling, therapy, safety planning. Um, we provide either multidisciplinary uh, treatment teams or, or child and family teams, um, advocacy, transportation. Um, so a wide range of services that, that are able to be tapped into. Um, to go into some of the stats, this is gonna be substantiated sexual abuse reports. So these are reports that came to us that our emergency response workers substantiated. The data that's up here is for zero to 11. Um, so you can see in, in 2018, um, a total of 10, um, nine, nine girls, one boy. If I expand that to 17-year-old, um, that ups the total number for 43 for 2018. Um, if I go f a total number from 2013 to 2018 of substantiated sexual abuse reports, it's 273. Mm. Sorry, these are a little bit harder to read, but this is a breakdown by age group. So on the up to 11 year old for female, 11 is the most prominent um, that we're seeing substantiated sexual abuse reports. And for male, you're looking at the seven and eight year old are our more prevalent um, substantiated sexual abuse reports. And I wanted to actually jump in. This is something you're gonna hear, um, but I can spend a little bit more time on the Child Advocacy Center. Um, I actually have the benefit of working in a system outside of, of Santa Clara County that had a very robust and developed um, child advocacy center model. And I can, I can attest that that was the center of that system's response to sexual abuse within, within um, all of the jurisdictions in, in the city that I worked in. Um, that it was much more of a location and it was the program and the model that was developed there. 
So I think for, for recommendations, it's really to make sure that there is um, barriers removed for agreements across agency, that there's funding available for specific positions, that if we have it as a specific siloed where we have a bunch of individual organizations coming to one location, it has to go a little bit beyond that, that we have to create the shared model that I think James has, has discussed, that it has to be that shared understanding and vision of what do we want to accomplish within that uh, advocacy center. Thank you. Cynthia and Andrew, welcome. Good evening. Uh, my name is Cynthia Melchor, and I'm the Community Support Manager at YWCA of Silicon Valley. Um, good evening. My name is Andrew Rivadeneira, and I am the Counseling and Therapy Coordinator at the YWCA of Silicon Valley. And we are here to talk about child sexual abuse responses, data we have collected, emerging trends, and our recommendations. When there is a report of child sexual assault, a sexual assault advocate is dispatched to provide confidential advocacy, connect the survivor to our internal services and external services, and provide support to the pediatric sexual assault forensic exam. The data we've collected from fiscal year 2016 through 2017 and fiscal year 2018 through 2019 indicate that we have responded to 177 pediatric sexual assault forensic exams. And of those, 133 children are now receiving 968 individual services from YWCA. That includes crisis counseling, case management, advocacy, and court accompaniment. The age and gender identity data of the children we have served are broken down as seen on this slide. 9% of the children receiving a forensic exam were between the ages of one month to one year. 56% of the children receiving a forensic exam identified as a female. From our experience as a service provider, we have noticed that there are a few emerging trends and risk factors. We have noticed that parents often lack the resources to provide appropriate childcare and therefore leave their children in vulnerable, vulnerable situations. We have also noticed that parents often seek long-term emotional support to heal from the effects of sexual assault in their family. We have also noticed that because children and adults receive their forensic exam in the same facility, the children often have to witness or come into contact with adults receiving a forensic exam, which places them at an increased risk of vicarious trauma. Right now, the adult and pediatric forensic exams take place 15 feet away from each other, and there's only one bathroom available to share. Thus, from these trends and risk factors, we recommend support for establishing a child advocacy center and increased funding for additional pediatric sexual assault team nurses. We also recommend funding long-term therapeutic services for survivors as well as for their extended family. And lastly, funding for prevention education programming for youth, which should be accompanied by intervention services like support groups at schools. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, that was a lot of information at one time, but you did a great job. And what we're going to do, just so all of you understand this, is we're going to hear from the second panel. We're going to then go to the public to get there so to hear from all of you, and then we're going to go to questions and comments, and we're going to do it at the same time. Um, and that way, we, and really, what I'm going to be looking—if there are questions, you can write them down. But what I'm really going to be looking for are there recommendations you want to lift up specifically, or questions you want to get answered. So I'm going to thank panel one, and I'm going to hope that you all can stay around in case the group that wants to ask you questions. And then I'm going to invite up panel two. And this panel is um, going to be discussing recommendations regarding current child sexual abuse reporting practices and barriers to reporting and accessing services. Good evening, everyone. Is this on? Yes. Hi, I'm Jennifer Kelleher Cloyd. I'm the Chief Program Officer at the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley, but primarily I'm here as the co chair of the Santa Clara, Santa Clara County uh, Child Abuse Prevention Council's work group specifically addressing childhood sexual abuse. 
As you can see from the slide, we uh, created an open work group that was multidisciplinary in nature and included all of our first responders as well as a critical mass of individuals who are survivors themselves or family members of survivors who did the hard work of reminding those of us that work in this system that when we say data and processes, we're really talking about people and lives, and I wanna thank many of them who are actually present today. Um, while we're talking about prevention, I wanna just say that response is prevention. Um, the data that I'm sure you all know well is that most um, child sexual abuse offenders do not offend once with one victim. They typically offend multiple times with multiple victims. So response and prevention are completely um, entangled and really can't be separated. Um, this work group was formed in 2017 um, at the Child Abuse Prevention Council retreat because of the rise of high profile cases. And really what came up was that despite the fact everyone was learning about incidents happening, folks really didn't know where to go for resources. There were significant questions raised about how the county was responding. There were both concerns that mandated reporters weren't following their obligations and reporting while at the same time there was significant frustrations by mandated reporters that they weren't receiving any response or cooperation from the investigating agencies. So that led to uh, this group essentially being formed. Um, we did a couple of things. We looked at both prevention and system response, and we did that by specifically walking through scenarios of how a child would move through from prevention and disclosure through investigation. Um, I wanna talk about prevention. First to say that the council itself allocated additional dollars alongside um, San Jose PD to specifically arrange for more prevention education towards children. We are literally barely scratching the surface there and most educational programs throughout our county have nothing specifically oriented towards this. Um, but while we need to focus on kids and we need to educate them and explain uh, what sexual abuse is, what we also need to do is train and support adults to receive those disclosures. We are creating further problems if we empower our children to speak and no one is prepared to listen or believe them or understand what they should do next. And alongside of that, we have to help focus our institutions on how to respond as a whole institution. I don't need to tell you the names of multiple high profile schools or teams or other uh, places that have not figured out a way to respond to this even when someone discloses and a report is made. So we need to focus on large institutions. In terms of system response, we identified many gaps, a lot of uh, which you've already seen in the data presented tonight. In particular, we noted that many children, well, a report was made, um, it was very difficult to find those children to follow through with actually getting investigative interviews by a trained interviewer as opposed to a patrol officer, um, and that many children were not getting the medical evaluations, and that was a difficult barrier. Cross-reporting streams had a number of delays, simple things like they were being delivered by the county pony instead of by fax. Um, and we also identified that many survivors were reporting their initial encounters with investigating agencies went poorly and it went downhill from there. Um, and the reality is, well, our systems in the criminal courts and in child welfare are set up to respond to some of these children, most children and most disclosures don't result in entry into either of those systems, and that is actually probably the biggest gap that we've uncovered. I'm not gonna belabor the Child Advocacy Center strategy. I think you've heard it six, seven, and you'll hear it nine more times. We like it, as you can tell. Um, but I wanna talk about what's important to include. First of all, it should coordinate our prevention efforts instead of it being all over the place, and we should pick one major curriculum so that we all speak the same language. The other thing that it really needs to do is streamline investigative functions and create a real access point instead of a barrier for families who might not be, quote, child welfare eligible or criminal court eligible. And the reality is, and I'm so glad, Judge Ryan, that you're here, most of these cases are being hashed out in family court where there are very little investigative resources, very little support, and in the end, a judge Thank who you. isn't skilled has to make a hard decision. Thank you very much. I think it's you again, Dan. All right. 
I think Erica gets the last word, so. Hi, good afternoon again. Dan Little, Assistant Director at DFCS. <laughs> The Department of Family and Children's Services works jointly with law enforcement when reports of child sexual abuse are received. Joint response calls in the DFCS's Child Abuse and Neglect uh, Center, the CAN Center, are responded to by an emergency response social worker with one, within one hour or as soon as possible. Child abuse reports received from a law enforcement agent, agency usually come to DFCS when a multidisciplinary interview is scheduled and the law enforcement agency initiated a child, the child abuse protocol. However, DFCS may receive the report of child abuse before law enforcement, and therefore DFCS initiates the child abuse protocol and activates a joint response. Um, I think Dr. Sturm already did my slide three, so I'm gonna leave that information that she presented. This is just an overview of the how calls come into our uh, CAN Center, the hotline. So the CAN Center receives thousands of calls per month, and the CAN Center social workers screen, screeners engage with callers to ask questions. The screener may refer a caller to services and can actually start the process to identify potential family strengths. Additionally, based on the information provided by a caller to the CAN Center, the screener social worker would identify the call as one of the following. It could be a joint response, an immediate response, or a 10-day response. All three of those would require follow-up with the family from an emergency response social worker. We could also have an evaluate out and a non-report. The opportunity to refer a family to services is available at any time during our engagement with the family. And Deborah and I actually copied the same information, so I'm gonna mm -hmm. go through these. Um, and recommendation um, that we're ensuring that our joint response with law enforcement are occurring whenever possible to make sure that we're not doing multi-interviews of children. And again, the, the child advocacy model, with my own experience, um, something that I think we haven't talked about in the system I came from, that, that Child Advocacy Center drove all of the tr system training. Um, they did the, the coordination for all of the kind of advocacy around sexual abuse within the system. It became kind of the hub. And I think children and families that were involved with that felt it was a safe place and it was a place where their voice was heard. So if we develop it again as a program for, for advocacy, for support, I think that's what the families really are looking for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, the delayed child abuse reporting and its impact on individuals, families, and our community. First, I wanted to start talking about a survivor. She was first 13 years old when I met her, and she had a long history of being suspended and even expelled from school. She had a lot of anger and hostility, um, especially with people in power. Um, There's numerous CP CPS reports where she, had yet, um, where she had never disclosed any harm being done to her. At the age of 13, she finally decided to share that she had been sexually assaulted by her father for over 10 years. After disclosing, she was able to receive support from an advocate, medical care, therapy, and ensure that the person that harmed her was held accountable. However, many people asked why she had chosen not to disclose sooner. It's important to understand that dynamics exist that exist, that exist in sexual assault, that there are thousands of studies that speak to this. Many times in sexual assault, there's a stigmatization, a self-blame that exists. The child may think they're responsible for what happened to them, that they're guilty of not saying anything sooner. Sometimes secrecy and shame continues to keep the survivor in silence. Sometimes youth are placed in helpless positions of not saying anything for fear of breaking up with the family. Sometimes the parent dismisses early tries of disclosure, and so the child remains silent. If they, sometimes they're powerless. There are threats of violence towards the people they love, so they, choose not to, so they choose to remain silent. None of us can step into another's shoes and truly understand the pressure, the impact, and the emotional turmoil that another has to endure. But it's important that we grasp, even for a moment, the harsh reality that survivors face. Additionally, Many times after enduring the assault, a child can develop unhealthy behaviors such as acting out with others, engaging in at-risk uh, behaviors such as violence or drugs, or even becoming overachievers to try to escape. This behavior impacts the child or youth, how others perceive them and the disclosure, and this may create an unconscious bias. This youth just looking for attention, or how could they be impacted, look how successful they are. They're even just delayed in disclosures. It's important to understand that survivors may even be exposed to the person that harmed them for several years and or decades. They may have a hard time remembering the basic details like clothing or month at the times of the disclosures. But it's important to remember that survivors remember. They remember the act and they remember the feelings that impacted on them. For some, the child was finally able to speak after the parents had been divorcing them. After many times, the disclosure was called into question and may be harder to prove. The impact, um, 
sometimes are unsubstantiated because of the allegations we're after and there's called to questions as to why they're saying it now. Or maybe sometimes the other non-offending parent is, is blamed for trying to feed the child that in information. And this can impact the child by having them have continued custody and visitations with the person that offends or that harmed them in the first place. Additionally, survivors could, that could qualify for a U or T visa may be older and it could impact their application or the derivatives applications for any kind of status um, um, abilities that way through visas. Some good news though that's um, in the last couple of years, there's been assembly bills that have been passed that have extended the statute of limitations for sexual harassment, um, civil orders, civil hearings. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, finish, Erica. Thank you. And also for um, the criminal justice pursuit for people to have some kind of support. So the recommendations that I wanted to kind of highlight is enhanced cross-reporting between DFCS and law enforcement. There's a great model that LA County just enhanced, uh, just launched, is to do an online cross-reporting system through probation, uh, law enforcement, CPS, so that all of those are set electronically and everybody's getting at real-time information for cross-reporting. Um, uh, another one that was already mentioned is having uh, medical exams for all children so that they can have healing for their own body and know that their body is okay. Um, it's also important to connect, advocate, or to connect survivors to an advocate who can help them provide that and navigate the system. I also wanted to highlight um, in utilizing and trying to import implicit bias training for professionals that work with survivors um, so that survivors are treated with compassion and respect. It's a great new program that was just launched. It's called Start By Believing. They have toolkits for law enforcement, officers, and others. Um, and it's a new global campaign to really have folks address and, and uh, look at what their implicit bias is and how that can impact the investigation moving forward. And obviously, prevention. Thank you, Thank you very much. I wanna give all of our speakers a round of applause for getting through a lot of data and information. So let me just talk about the next two steps. So um, the way we did the agenda today is that we have our this item, item two. We're gonna hear from the public, then I'm gonna get your questions and comments and make a series of recommendations, and then we're gonna go to public comment. And the reason we did it that way is we wanted to make sure that folks had a chance to weigh in on this topic if they wanted to do so, and then we'd still be available for public comment. I say that because not everybody, um, and I didn't do a good job of explaining it, so I'll just apologize for that. So what I'm gonna do is I have some folks who, who have signed up specifically for public comment, and that's item three, and I will call on those cards in just a moment. Um, for everybody, if you, if you left it blank, I'll call you up. If you mean to be for public comment, that's okay. If you're talking about what just got presented, your personal experience, your observations about what you'd like to see improved, then you wanna speak now. If you wanna speak more generally about um, sexual assault, then I would recommend item three. Um, but either one, you're, I'm very open. So I'm just gonna call you in the order that I have your cards, and I am gonna apologize in advance if I mis, um, mispronounce anybody's name. Uh, Lisa, uh, Latina, and Mike, uh, Michelle Cisneros or Michael, Catherine Campbell, and then this last card, Perla, do you want to speak on item three or two? So do, try not to bring them blank. Let's ask people what they, what they want. So if you can just give that to a minute. Uh, Roberta Fitzpatrick asked to speak on both. So for, and you can come up in any order if I've called your name. Um, I have anonymous for two and three. Um, Bruce Hodgins, I think, I apologize. And if this is the time, Anna uh, Gabriella Her Hermosa, um, Aaron O'Brien, and Amanda. And Perla is for this item, great. And Steve, uh, Steve is for three. Two minutes, yeah. So we're gonna do two minutes for each person. And if you're here to speak to an item that we just spoke on the agenda, this is a time. If it's public comment broadly, then you, I'll call you up um, then. Welcome and thank you for being patient. Thank you so much for having us today. Um, today there is hope. There is hope, change is coming. I can only imagine the hope of the slaves in the South to think one day they may be free. I can only imagine what it was like to not be able to have the right to vote. Those who knew it though knew one thing, it takes time. In our county in 2005, the abuse to my children was dismissed. I was forced to share custody with their named abuser when I left and it was determined by experts that our children did not need protection. In 2012, I lost full custody to the name abuser. 
as a way to silence us from speaking of the abuse. I was told that if I told the children that they were safe with their father, that it never happened, and that if they agree, I agreed to never report him again, I would get custody back. In 2018, my children aged out of their abuse after telling many people multiple times of their abuse. Our county not only turned a blind eye to abuse, they attacked me for reporting the abuse. My children escaped without being murdered like many people, including 700 children in the US since 2007. I thought the Me Too movement was to bring change to our family situations here in our county. Our numbers show we only substantiate 10% of the reported sexual abuse when only four to 6% are false. This month I witnessed an alleged sexual abuser walk out of Family Justice Center with custody of his child after I directly heard the abuse stated to the judge. We have a long way to go and we have children we need to take care of today. It is time we believe children. Having this meeting gives me hope that one day, and I pray very soon, that when I hear another child is being sexually abused by a parent, that they will be heard, that they will be believed, and they will be protected. And that doesn't mean that they go home with that parent. That is not protection. Thank you. Thank you. As each person comes forward, if you could introduce yourselves just so I make sure I, that everybody gets a chance to speak. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Roberta Fitzpatrick. On March 25th, 2009, the body of a young girl was found in a backyard grave two and a half years after she had been declared a runaway. A family court judge who disregarded the documented signs of the father's criminal life and character had sent her to live in danger. On February 2nd, 2018, Alicia Mercedes' father was sentenced to life in prison plus 243 years for 49 counts, including murder, and for the sexual abuse of Alicia and two other girls. Alicia's father had two attorneys in family court, and her mother had none. The money and the power were on the male parent's side. There was no level playing field, and there are no due process rights in family court. Sadly, there have been several murders of children by dangerous parents since my great niece, Alicia, was sent to live with her abuser and murderer. No protective parent should be unable to protect their children because he or she cannot afford an attorney. I ask that the supervisors establish a pro bono or sliding scale pool of attorneys, perhaps in conjunction with the Bar Association, to help disadvantaged parents protect their children in contested custody proceedings. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Lisa Latina Michelle Cisneros. Um, I'm a public member, and this is a piece I wrote to bring um, awareness for this topic. Questions left unanswered. You know what? I think um, your I think your um, your computer is oh. blocking the microphone. I'm sorry. It's embedded in there. Thank you. Okay. Questions left Perfect. unanswered lingered through my mind. Years of wondering. Still, I'm behind. <coughs> Tucking corners of the bed so they're incapable to find. Will my fear get the best of me? Can I put up a fight? Eyes shut tight, begin the terror of the night. Heart screams for help, voice can't get the words right. Am I the first for you or will I be the last? And how long will this horror last? Shattered past of my youth, innocence no longer true. Hold my throat as he whispers, if you tell, no one will care. Hands up every part of me, reveal the ugly truth. Inside a lost child, worthless, broken, hushed and confused. Enduring pain, not just from you, cause after him, there was many more to realize then it's sink or swim. Another bed I sleep on, awaiting my escape. Soon enough, another nightmare approach to seal my fate. Close your eyes as we run throughout the time. No rose can bloom without its thorns. Soon enough, you'll be all right. Hear the stories of a child's broken dream. Close your eyes, leave your mind, try to imagine what I mean. 
Hear the stories on the news, never thinking it'd be you. Try to tell my story once, cop said it's nothing to pursue. Did he do it? Are you sure? Did you even get proof? Our childlike mentality flew straight out the roof. Decided to endure it so my friends won't go through. Thought if I took this burden all to myself, then he wouldn't dare try to lay his hands on someone else. Like a book on a shelf, I was a chapter left inside. Screaming in my head, no one to see my fight. As I wake to daylight, I see a new me. Forgot the young, loving girl whom I used to be. Below the belt, hands I sneak, tearing every part of me. Still, it's not enough for your own family to see. Leave the sight of the innocent and guilty set free. One story of plenty, silence voices speak to see. Felt like it's my fault for not saying more. But how can someone not hear what's going on behind the doors? Silently beg no more as he enters in the room. Coming closer, hear the steps, a life forever doomed. As he sneaks in, I try to hide underneath. As, I, as he... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Thank you. It's beautiful. Welcome. Hello, um, my name is Amanda Valenzuela. Um, I have come and spoken before um, sharing my story about being a sexual victim. Um, I'll just start off by saying that um, it all started when I was 10 years old. It was by a family member. Um, this family member had lived in the same home as I was in my grandmother's house. It had happened in the middle of the night when my parents were asleep. He would call for me and from the other room and say, Amanda, come here. I wasn't sure because this uncle had loved me very much. He would take me to buy me McDonald's and pick me up from school. But the night that he had first started, I will never ever forget. And so, because these memories were suppressed and I had never told a soul until these memories had came up, not until of 2018 of January, it had taken me some time to heal and to process and to bloom. When I had first shared my story here at the first hearing of sexual assault victims, I felt this small voice that was hiding inside finally come out. I had cried and begged for family members to believe me, but as of now, majority of those family members no longer speak to me. And this is on my dad's side of the family. And so I'm currently sharing my story in public in the hopes that maybe one day they will listen to this voice too. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. I'd like to speak in the open comment section later, but um, as of right now, sir, madam, educators, medical professionals, law enforcement, mental health, social services, attorneys, judges, legal, and judicial professionals, advocates and governing leaders, experts, parents, friends, neighbors, victims and survivors. As of today, half a year has passed since I first told you what was happening to shatter the lives of two children in your city. After tonight, will you be their champion? The children, according to the statistics that Dr. Sturm has um, illustrated, will have aged out through 66% of the cases for the SART team that they've seen. Coming to you at two years old and now they're four and five, how many more years? The family court and failing systems and outdated and overburdened protocols in place supports and sanctions the sex trafficking, trafficking of children to their abusers for the predators, <clears throat> violent and sexual pleasure, mandated sex trafficking. This let me know that these children are endangered by falling into every single gap of every protocol of every agency and institution, leaving them unaddressed, vulnerable, and a victim of ongoing trauma, worse off for reporting, because now the predator was informed, creating an environment of not post, but ongoing trauma, not hypothetical, but in real life terms. The people who have presented before you today are my heroes, Yet I am mad at myself and all of them and everybody 
who has a governing stake in this claim because these children have somehow not cut the mustard in getting their abuse to stop. That's right. Somehow I've seen that we fail to be heard. How do victims walk out feeling that they didn't do it right, unsubstantiated over and over again? Welcome. Hello, uh, my name is Ana Gabriela Hermosillo Rivera in Villarreal. I have a professional and personal experience to share. Uh, for the last six years, I have worked as a mental health provider working with different agencies in the county. And I have worked with children, you know, CSEC children. I have worked in dual diagnosis. I have just a lot of experience. So part of my job is hearing these cases of people being raped, you know, as children or even ch the children who are currently being raped. Just yesterday, I heard of a case. So for me, this is a daily bread that I have to eat every day. But uh, in 2011, it was November, I found out that my ex-husband, who was, um, he retired from the San Jose Police Department after 28 years and then went to work to the Santa Clara County uh, Sheriff's Department. He was watching child porn. I knew it because of my personal uh, convictions, because of my Christian uh, beliefs, and because of my mandated reporter that I needed to report that. And it was a difficult experience because we were happily married for 20 years. I have everything that people wanted to have, going to the best places in the world, trips, and everything. And then I have this reality. And I pray and I say, I'm gonna do what I know my God wants me to do. So I went and report all these crimes that I found out. And what happened? The Gilroy Police Department engaged in not writing domestic violence report and minimizing his child porn. Eventually, he ended up committing other crimes against me, including IRS fraud, and the last one, he attempted to kill one of my children in May of this year. And what has happened to this person, to this perpetrator? He has been pampered by the DA office because I have reported all these crimes to them many times. I have reported details. I have went through hours and hours of being interviewed and they cover up the crimes. So what are we gonna do about that? Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Bruce Hodgen. I'm also a mandatory reporter. I'm reading this on behalf of my daughter, Cheryl Hodgen Marshall, who was unable to attend because of a medical procedure. I quote, in 1990, when my best friend was 16, she was sexually assaulted by her Spanish teacher, still bothering <laughs> high school. Despite her reporting the assault to three different school officials, they never contacted the police. Instead, they allowed the known pedophile to remain at the school 20 more years, endangering thousands of girls for decades. In fact, the same year the administration awarded the pedophile teacher of the year, he was accused for the fifth time of assaulting a, ch a student. Both my best, best friend and I filed reports earlier last year, but we have yet to hear back from the police or the DA. While my friend's abuser is dead, his enablers have yet to be held accountable. Some still work at presentation. How many other children have they endangered? How many other abusers have they protected? For decades, presentation appears to have sanctuary school for pedophiles. I have a little more time, so I'm going to add something that she didn't write. Another teacher who uh, abused a child, a drama teacher, was uh, uh, they attempted to keep her on because of financial. They raised money to have a, a summer drama program. Other parents stepped in and caused that occur. Caused that they let him leave with no. Uh, record. He went to two other public schools that I'm aware of. He went on then to a private school, molested a 14-year-old special needs girl who was smart enough to report it to her principal, and the principal did her job. He's now a registered sex offender. Presentation, let him go. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Hi, Steve Barron, and I'm on for number three, but kind of all the same, so I'll speak okay. now. The, um, um, the concept of the Child um, Advocacy Center uh, that everybody's on board with now, and we really appreciate that, uh, number one. Um, <clears throat> that's going forward. Je Jennifer Kelleher's um, uh, task force from the Child Abuse Prevention Council started with one phone call 
from one woman who said, I'm worried about an issue about child sexual abuse in my family or somebody I know. Who do I call first? <clears throat> and you know, sometimes people don't want to call the police. And there's not just one agency you call for that. I just want to let everybody here know that back in 1975 through 1982, there was one phone number. It was the Child Sexual Abuse Treatment Program. It was located in the Juvenile Probation Department. The first year provided services to 25 families. By 1982, when it closed after Proposition 13 and budgetary concerns and layoffs and was sent out to the community, it was taking 500 phone calls, intake phone calls a year, because if you build it, they will come. Services were provided to anybody who wanted them at no cost to everybody in the family. What we don't have in this county is one trauma treatment and training center where that could coordinate and case manage treatment. And that concept of the Child Advocacy Center coordinating and case managing cases so people don't get lost in the cracks is something that is absolutely doable because people need one phone number to call to start off and then they can take them not just give them another phone number to call, but case manage them from then on, and then these people won't start falling through the cracks and they'll get the services they need. Thanks. Thank you. Welcome. Okay. Uh, Ken Borelli, I'm uh, with the uh, Santa Clara County Child Abuse Prevention uh, Commission. I'm an emeritus member, but I'm speaking for myself right now. There are a couple of issues that I just want to highlight. Number one is, Basically, the fear to outreach to get help in the community, especially in the immigrant communities. Uh, the hesitancy of people having to make a choice of coming forward, the fear of um, being exposed because of their immigration status is really, take, is really impacting our community and there needs to be a way to get the word out that if you call law enforcement or you call a authority agency it's not going to be cross-reported to immigration this is really critical because there's that lack of confidence for that reason too i'm very strongly supportive of keeping these services out in the community because there's a sense of trust in that community, even amongst churches, service agencies, whatever. And then the third thing is that we've really black, uh, backslided a little bit uh, in terms of really coordinating our services. Uh, at one point in Santa Clara County, there was a Green Book initiative. Santa Clara County was one of six counties nationally to coordinate these services. Well, for lack of funding, they dissolved. Even though these services are here, the question and problem is they're not coordinated. So you'll have one response one way, another response another way, and then transpose today's world with the anti-immigrant sentiment. Uh, it's really pretty tragic, and we're seeing the consequences. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks. Hi, Erin O'Brien with Community Solutions. Wanted to speak in support of the recommendations that have been made today and, and for the CAC. But I also wanted to say, to acknowledge that the reality is that it is only a small fraction of the children who are sexually abused who come to any system's attention. And so what we do in terms of prevention and outreach is vitally important. And I think that we have an obligation to assertively outreach to these kids. And once upon a time, the state used to fund the sexual assault agencies in this county and elsewhere to, do, to go into the schools and do child abuse prevention. And one of my coworkers used to be a part of the team that did that for our agency. And she said, it was extremely rare that they would do a presentation at a school that at least one child did not disclose. So by not doing those uniformly throughout the county, how many kids are we not reaching with the help that they need? And I will tell you, I myself was molested between the time I was five and eight. I cannot tell you how many of my friends it happened to. None of us went to systems. None of us are any of the statistics that, that are counted. So I think that the obligation that we have to reach out to these kids and say, we're here for you, you can talk to us, and it's safe, it's huge. So thank you. Also, we have a couple confidential sexual assault advocates here tonight, so if anybody is kind of needing somebody to talk to, Erica's there, Pearl is there, we can bring more if you need it. Thank you. 
Good evening, Petra Flores with Community Solutions. I want to firstly thank all of the individuals that had the courage to come forward and share their, their stories. It's really, it's really moving and it's, it's really challenging to, to hear to the, the pain and anguish that they went through and that they're still going through. And I want to commend this county and everybody that, that's a part of this day as for really um, prioritizing support to sexual assault survivors and particularly children. Um, so definitely in, in support of the different recommendations that were brought forward here today. A couple of things that came up um, to me is um, we heard a couple of times that early access to a confidential advocate is really important. And one of the pieces that where there doesn't seem to be um, consistency is in terms of the um, interpretation and implementation of right to a confidential advocate for sexual assault survivors. So obviously we'll always, we will always be called when there is a SART to respond to the SART, but other children that are perhaps interviewed by law enforcement or DFCS and others, or other systems, there isn't a consistent referral to um, confidential advocacy services. And with the support of this county, because we also heard since the majority of the survivors are minors, that there's a need for comprehensive support to the family. So we're really thankful to this county for the, the flexible funding that's coming forward to be able to support not just the primary survivor, which is the child, but also the family. So just um, looking forward to having conversations on how we can ensure that survivors, regardless of whether or not there's a SART, that they are connected to a confidential advocate and uh, to all of the supportive services that are going to be in place for the families as well. And thank you again for everything that you're doing for sexual assault abuse survivors. Thank you, Perla. Welcome. <coughs> Hello, my name is Emmanuel Bari. I attended the Islamic School of San Diego um, for 10 years. Um, when I was 11 years old, I was sexually assaulted by my sixth grade social studies and PE teacher. Um, and he attempted to abduct me as well and convince me to be his child bride. Um, I had reported the incident to my computer teacher, my science teacher, the principal, the vice principal. Um, my father is actually an imam in San Diego, which is a religious leader. He was also the founder of the school, and he was a board member. Um, I had reported to all the adults, including my parents and several teachers, the principal and vi vice principal. Nobody reported what had happened to me. Um, they had a board meeting um, with my offender, and they decided to let him go. Um, so he kept his teaching license, but they did fire him from the school. Um, the man relocated with his child and wife to Santa Clara County. Um, I actually recently did a um, background check on him. Just, just been very curious for the past 15 years um, about his whereabouts. I have found out that he actually committed suicide in 2008, and I feel that um, I have definitely gotten the justice that many of us have not. Um, and it's actually the first time I've ever been happy that someone's life has been taken. Um, I never got the justice that I needed as a child. When I was in eighth grade, two years after the incident, um, I was given an email. I was hand given an email by my vice principal. Um, I had opened it and it was a letter from my, um, my offender. And he tried communicating me through the school email, and she allowed it. They did not contact my parents. Um, after reading the email, I attempted suicide. Um, I, was, I was not successful because my sister saved my life. Um, and he committed suicide in 2008. Thank you for sharing your story. Welcome. My name is Dina Leonis. You should have a comment card for me. Thanks, Dina. When my daughter was a freshman in Presentation High School, she was 13 years old, she was sexually assaulted and penetrated by her water polo coach. Multiple students alerted press officials to sexual misconduct, but they dismissed the reports and allowed the coach to stay the rest of the season. Prez failed to prevent the assault. My daughter and I have been working with the police and DA for years now, but no charges have been filed, citing insufficient evidence. But the police report is missing key evidence, including phone records I personally retrieved and delivered that should have been subpoenaed, interviews from at least four witnesses, additional medical records. The police never even interviewed Jenna Rowe, the abuser, in person. We have a pretext phone call on file where she admitted to buying, wanting to purchase a dildo for my 13-year-old daughter. What does it take? What does it take? She's free now to do it again. You failed me and my family. Thank you for telling us your story. I'm sorry for your, your pain. Welcome. 
Thank you. I'm Kate Lahane. You should also have a comment card um, from me. I uh, want to thank you for hearing me, and I applaud all of the work that you're doing in this regard. So as many of you know, uh, because I keep coming back, I was sexually molested by my Spanish teacher at Presentation High School. School officials knew about it, but they covered it up. In fact, they covered up multiple sexual assaults by this same predator. We've been working with the police and the DA for about 22 months now, but we can't get any straight answers. There is plenty of evidence of conspiracy and child endangerment. Letters to and from school officials, to, between school officials and victims. There are dozens of victims. There are multiple witnesses. But the police won't tell us if they're actually investigating for these crimes. And the DA acts as though they have absolutely no influence in the investigation. What is wrong with our system when we won't even stand up for victims of child sexual abuse and we won't even investigate and prosecute the offenders? I'm here and I will keep coming back and I'm begging you to please do your jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Welcome. My name is Daniel Wood. I think you have a card for me there. When my daughter was a sophomore at Presentation High School, she was molested by the theater teacher. She bravely filed a police report over a year ago and still to this day has not heard anything. Anything. No witness, including the person who saw Hicks kissing my daughter or any other presentation administrator or teacher knew my daughter had been molested and are still employed at that school to this day. They've never been interviewed. Hicks is a registered sex offender. He was released to go on to sexually molest another child. He's free in San Jose to offend again. If you want to decrease the rate of child abuse, I strongly suggest you investigate, prosecute the cases you currently have. Please. Thank you. Thank you, and thank all of you very much for sharing uh, your stories that are so personal and painful. I also want to just th um, ask again for the advocates, if they could raise their hands, if anybody would like to to speak to them. And I'm so grateful to all of you for being here, Community Solutions and the why in the house. It's great. Um, what I, here's what I would like to recommend. Um, we have a few more public speakers that would like to speak under public comments. So I want to be mindful that we're going to be wrapping up around 7. What I'm interested in getting feedback from is if anybody has any questions, and I'm going to, I'm going to start from this side, questions and or recommendations you want to um, weigh in on, then, then uh, this would be the time to do that. When, when I'm done hearing all of you, I'm going to make a few recommendations just based on what I've heard and to ask Dave if that works for us in terms of how we proceed. All right, so um, if you want to speak, you can just turn your light on. And Sylvia, I know that you, you have a time constraint, so we'll start with you. Thank you so much, uh, Chair. I, first of all, I want to thank all the survivors for having the courage to come tonight and share um, your very painful experiences. I know that <clears throat> you have an advocate in me, and you know I, I know the rest of the the, uh, the folks up here on the dais um, are doing their best. But there's always room to improve, and so you keep us um, honest and you keep us uh, working harder to make sure that our systems are as seamless as, um, as it, they can be and as uh, responsive to, to all of you as, as they can be. Um, I also want to thank um, our supervisor, Chavez, because it, when we first did our, our first joint uh, meeting and we had a, um, a follow-up conversation, all I had to do is we both recognized that, that um, the main uh, focus of uh, sexual assault was 
children. And before we even, I even finished the sentence asking her to please uh, let's follow up on this. There was already a hearing established. That, I mean, it, just know that there is a huge advocate in Supervisor Chavez for our children and our sexual assault um, victims and, and survivors. Um, and I know that this group here um, has uh, the, their heart in the right place to make sure that we're going to make some changes. And so um, part, of the, part of that update, and, and, and thank you, Dr. Strom, Sturm and, and Dr. Ritter and our district attorneys, um, <coughs> Terry and James. Um, your jobs are difficult, I know. And um, we want to make sure that our systems are the best that they can be because it's people like you that, that make a difference for, for our children. So I just wanted to give a really quick update about what we've done so far. And, um, and lastly, I do want to thank all of my council colleagues who've joined me in this effort, Councilmember Carrasco and Councilmember Esparza, and our, our fierce leader, um, our chief of police, who's... Um, been uh, nothing but receptive in, in listening to our concerns and making sure that his staff is ready to um, um, listen and, and analyze and take next steps. And so as part of that process, we've um, produced a, a work plan, if you will, through our city manager's office. And um, I'm going to pass this work plan to all of you, and I, um, you can read it at your leisure. Um, but I just wanted to give some highlights. Last week, we did have um, our own hearing on the San Jose uh, side of, of this uh, to take a look at our uh, data, to take a look at our systems, and one of the and our service and a lot of our service providers and advocates were there to give us feedback as well. And we heard loud and clear that Child Advocacy Center is 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 absolutely important. Um, that. Um, there is an issue maybe or a possible potential issue with the authorization by law enforcement for SART exams. Um, and I want to make sure that that's not part of the problem uh, because I heard from a lot of service providers that there's not enough exams being completed on our children. Um, we also heard loud and clear that it's important to have peer reviewed um, forensic interviewers um, to make sure that we get the right type of feedback from our, our survivors. And so uh, uh, so thank you so much for being there for us. Part of what San Jose uh, Police Department and Chief, if you want to um, also add to this, is that they had a contract with um, University of Texas to take a look at our data since 2012 up to current date. And um, one of the conclusions that I wanted to raise here is that, which is Obviously, something we all know, um, but San Jose's sexual assault uh, day, um, numbers are higher than the national average, and I think by 18 percent. And the change of the rape uh, for the UCR um, and the definition of what rapes are in uh, 2012, I believe, but uh, or 2013, and we uh, complied with that, um, conformed to it, I think, in 2015, doesn't account for the rise in sexual assaults. So there was more sexual assaults because of the rape um, and included, uh, uh, it, it was uh, very broad, um, and so included a lot of other specifics and so that made those numbers rise uh, or increase, but it doesn't explain the increase over the years and there's been an increase over the years and so our, our chief of police is very much um, invested in, in making sure that um, our systems are um, working as best as they can. He's committed to a work plan. We have a spending plan that um, on our end, our, my colleagues and I asked for 800,000 um, to make sure we have some training. And so he's committed to having department-wide training and um, uh, sexual assault uh, prevention education. That's something separate that we also, that I, my office also funded. Um, and the potential creation of a San Jose uh, special victims unit as our budget allows. Um, but I love that our uh, police department and our chief of police has taken a look at uh, at these concerns very seriously and, um, and actually making changes. Um, we've augmented, I think, five additional officers um, to our sexual assault unit, and I think potentially another five are on their way. Um, and so 
I, I really hope that our, our special victims unit does, um, is a reality. Um, because as you can see, there is a, a vast issue of sexual assaults, especially around our children. And so we need to make sure that we have a unit that focuses on that. Um, one of the recommendations that I have as we move forward and we talk is that to have the same type of, or same data. Um, we brought in 2015 to 2018. I think some folks had last year's data. I think we just need to make sure that we're um, comparing apples to apples. Um, and so fr from that data, I realized that, that um, Dr. Sturm, you see more three to four year olds, which is something that you shared with us, but it doesn't, that doesn't show in our police department data. And so that obviously tells us that they're starting with you uh, versus us, or somehow we're not capturing them. Um, or those are the folks, or those are the victims or survivors that are tending to your, um, to your center. The other thing is, is really is a, um, is a cry for a, a public health, you know, this is a public health crisis, I feel. And especially for our children of color, um, I wanna say about 90% of all the crimes that our analysts um, in our San Jose Police Department, they were uh, our children of color and their assailants were also uh, people of color. And we really need to have a public health campaign to make sure that all of our diverse cultures and um, groups in San Jose um, uh, sh share the same information um, for, for reporting, but also to support some of those adults that are in the lives of those children, as we've heard over and over from, from our um, advocates and from our survivors, um, that the adults uh, surrounding those children also need to have the type of support to be able to believe those children and to take those cases further um, and stand up for our children. So I think it's part of having a, a public health campaign, um, an educational campaign, aside from just going to the schools. Um, I think it's about time that we talk about something just as uncomfortable as it can get. Um, but this is something that should be on every commercial, on every bus on the back of you know, every ad possible to help um, legitimize and acknowledge all of our survivors in this county. Um, that is my feedback and I apologize ahead of time. I, I do need to go to a general plan task force meeting. Um, I'd rather my heart is here, I'd rather stay here, but uh, it's part of my obligations and so I will um, leave shortly after my, my comments. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else over here want to give, lift up a recommendation or give feedback or ask a question? Miguel? Oh. Go ahead, Miguel, and then I'll go back. Uh, thank you, Supervisor. So thank you. I want to echo many of the things Council Member Arenas said uh, and thank those who are here sharing their stories, those who work on the issue. Um, I had experience on the court myself and had way too many of these cases come across uh, for my, you know, for what I was doing, and I, I learned a lot from those cases. They're horrible cases, very difficult. Um, but one thing that I definitely learned in that process is how much support is needed by the families who experience this. Um, and I agree wholeheartedly with the public health campaign that was just talked about, but I think it has to be deeper than that. I think all the systems that we create have to recognize how diverse our community is. It's a human problem. It's a cultural problem in many respects. People say, culturally, I don't feel comfortable uh, telling people what happened. Uh, how does that family unit deal with it? So the structures that we build around trying to address this issue have to really be culturally competent, and that's gonna be difficult, but it's something that we have to face. It's something that if we wanna be effective, we have to look at that. And I was taken by one of the reports that showed the five zip codes so I looked up where those zip codes are, and they're all sort of in the east side of San Jose, maybe going a little bit south. I mean, that, that tells you a lot right there. So I don't know where we are in terms, I know we, we are committed to doing more, to working harder, to building more. And when we do that, I just wanna be an advocate for really looking at the cultural competency that's gonna be required in the services that we build. Great, thank you. Anybody else over here before I go to the side, Mike Delano or Eddie? I don't know which, I see moving around, but no. All right. Okay, sorry, 
Thank you. Um, I actually also wanted to acknowledge uh, Miguel Marquez to thank you for your partnership. I know you've been meeting with the San Jose city manager um, regularly on this, and so I wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you. Um, I uh, wanted to ask a question, which is why are the substantiated abuse reports so low? Who can? Do you have a particular slide you're looking at? Um, maybe it with was slide in now? the first panel. Dan, I think this was a number that you gave, but maybe Dan or Terry, one of you could respond to that. But uh, Dan, I think these were your numbers. And these were numbers that were reflection, I think, of the, the emergency response of our social workers. Yes, yeah, so these, these aren't an indication of the number of, of, of of child victims of sexual abuse. It's the number of times that um, the Department of Family and Children's Services were involved and had an emergency response worker uh, respond and then substantiated those, those allegations against a parent or a caretaker. So allegations of, um, of abuse against maybe a, a, a teacher or something wouldn't necessarily fall into this category. Um, and this was something to show that a parent had didn't do something to protect, but typically that would be the case for that situation. So, so what we are, what our allegations, our substantiations are on the actual caretaker. Okay, but I think that speaks to the point that um, Jennifer raised about the co-reporting and a centralized mechanism for co-reporting, because that that actually speaks to, because I was intrigued with that as well in terms of all the different numbers. Yeah, and it was referred to also in the first panel and then in the second panel, and there are different numbers. So that was something that stood out. Um, I also wanted to um, talk about the need, and maybe it's first five here. Oh, I see Jolene. Um, the need, um, to have a differentiated, oh, sorry, I can't talk, a differential response so that we can include unsubstantiated cases in the system, because I think there's this whole bifurcation and clearly the majority of victims um, aren't going through that system. And I don't know if Jolene could talk more about that or if there's somebody else on one of the panels that could speak to that. Go ahead, Jolene, did you wanna respond? Well, I. Thank you. Um, I Thank you, Maya. I think that it's really important to acknowledge that substantiated and unsubstantiated, there's trauma involved regardless. There's something going on. And so we need to do fact-finding on why unsubstantiated children are uh, the victims of whatever's going on in their system. We have a robust differential response system at social services. In fact, First Five used to fund it, and now social services sustains it on a regular basis for calls that have a prevention network of community-based organizations. I think Community Solutions and the Y are benefactors. But I think that what's lacking in all of that is a coordinated approach and common data sharing, because the risk factor is a risk factor. Some are more intense than others, but what we don't have is a coordinated response. So kids who are unsubstantiated and are referred to one of our community-based organizations, what else is, do they need? When you look at the risk factors that were referred earlier, they're definitely connected to the social, the six social determinants of health, and our kids are entering school, in school, in neighborhoods, with risk factors that neither you or I would wanna have in our lives. So how do we create a network, not just for substantiated, but also for unsubstantiated, and I think that what you raise is really important because the safety net isn't coordinated and it's not a criticism, it's reality. And we don't actually collect common data on impact. What is the long-term impact of the prevention efforts all the way through the treatment efforts for substantiated children? So I, I applaud your question, but if I may, Supervisor Chavez, say that um, this is a systems level issue that goes mm -hmm. from prevention to treatment we have incredible partners in this community. The, the resource center, the, the advocacy center is amazing um, opportunity for us to come together and really create impact and collect data without restrictions on sharing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I wanted to um, also bring up the zip codes. I think when we were here six months ago, it was something that definitely took us aback um, in looking at the numbers. Um, and and I do, I agree. There are all these other um, things that put certain 
kids and families at risk. And at the city of San Jose's hearing that we had recently, one of the recommendations that came out of that was to have sort of an ethnic based agency outreach into that because we have communities of color who are not reporting um, who, and who are not part of the system in any way. And we need to really um, capture that as well. Um, and that sort of leads to my main point, which is we really need to have services in the community um, and make sure that we're um, putting that in the neighborhoods and in the community where the, instead of having everybody come to the county or to the city or wherever, that we really need to be mindful of that. And that's all. Thank you. Anybody else on this side? All right. Yeah. I'll, I'll make it brief because uh, Folks uh, have already stated a lot of what I wanted to express. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Supervisor Chavez and Supervisor Cortez for your ongoing advocacy of so many of the really critical issues that we're dealing with at the county. And of course, uh, representing the largest city in the county, we're very grateful for, uh, for uh, you drawing this attention to an issue that we've been, we've been also trying to bring to the forefront. Um, which is domestic violence and, and sexual uh, abuse as we see the numbers that are climbing. Uh, I want to thank also all of the speakers that were here, but especially those who spoke up against the injustices and, and the experiences that they've had throughout their lifetime, especially those who have survived um, uh, unspeakable crimes against your person. Uh, thank you for being here. It's, it's very difficult to listen to, but uh, not, not anywhere near as difficult as I imagine uh, it has been to live with those experiences. So thank you so much for being here and sharing that with us. Um, a few things that I wanted to just mention. The zip codes that, um, that demonstrate the highest numbers, which have the highest risk factors, are three of those are in my district which is so alarming to me because not only am I now dealing with domestic violence, gang hotspots, uh, high incidence of poverty, gentrification, now I'm dealing with the high numbers of sexual abuse. So if we know where those numbers are, uh, to me it's not, you know, it's not an Easter egg hunt. Now we know where they are. We know where the risk factors are it makes it easier for us, in my opinion, to really focus in and be laser beam uh, uh, focused and determined to uh, intervene and prevent. Um, so um, I don't like it that it's all focused on the east side, but that it makes it just a little bit easier to focus our resources as scarce as they may be. The other... Um, the other uh, issue, and uh, Council Member Sparza brought up, is uh, one of the speakers brought up that uh, one of the emerging trends or risk factors is the lack of resources for, for the parents. And so they tend to leave their children maybe unsupervised or they put them in vulnerable situations. We did a study as well in the city of San Jose and we found that on the east side of San Jose, so it's not surprising that it tends to coincide one way or the other, that there is a huge need for childcare services, uh, quality childcare and uh, ch uh, quality preschool, yet there is the greatest need or, or greatest uh, uh, lack of on the east side of San Jose. So again, it gives us an opportunity to really uh, concentrate our resources again in those areas. And then um, the fact that, um, as it was stated before, that this is a crime of opportunity and that 80% or more is of a known person is uh, all that more troubling. Um, and uh, it was stated in one of the uh, slides, we teach our children about stranger danger, and maybe we need to re, um, we need to reimagine that message or we need to change the narrative of that. And uh, we, we all have very loving uncles, and they are loving uncles, and we should not never take that away. But in some cases, we also need to teach and we need to change the narrative 
because 80% is, uh, and it's not an uncle necessarily, it's a, a neighbor, it's a teacher, it's a teacher, it's a coach. Um, trust has to be reframed, I think. So, um, um, and then the last thing that I just am very concerned about, when I, when I worked for First Five under Jolene Smith, um, uh, I, we did a pilot program, which I was very proud to be a part of, which was under, with, uh, it was in Judge Chapman's uh, court, and that was working with families who were going through uh, custody uh, battles, and anyone who had even the slightest remote possibility of domestic violence had an, a social emotional assessment. And I'm not sure if that's still happening, but that is a, a risk factor. Um, and like you stated, what kind of risk factor, what, the intensity, it doesn't matter, it's a risk factor. And I would hope that that's still happening or that we can fund it or we can figure out how to get back into those courts because in family court, as we're hearing, our children are in danger, whether they're coming in through CPS or not. Uh, these kids are not being flagged, and there is a possibility of, uh, of lethality one way or the other. So um, th those are my comments, Supervisor. Thank you. Eddie? I'll, I'll keep my comments brief, Supervisor. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I will start off as well, and my heart going out to all the victims and hearing your stories is painful. Um, I will say that it's very important to us as professionals, that not only as professionals, um, I can tell you personally as a father of two boys and a daughter that it's also personal with, the, with these crimes. Um, I look at myself as I'm trying to train and teach a daughter to be safe, and I'm also training and teaching my boys to be respectful. Uh, we're prioritizing sexual assault with the San Jose Police Department, not only use, utilizing the University of Texas at San Antonio and the criminologists to help us uh, discover trends and patterns and how we can better police this issue. Um, in our upcoming budget conversations, this will be a priority. Trauma-informed training for the entire department, for the entire department, not just the detectives that investigate these calls uh, after the fact, but the ones that are responding firsthand. Like not only that we're trying to establish a special victims unit uh, and its supervisor, but increasing the capacity in our general sexual assault crimes in order to better investigate more efficiently these uh, incidents. Uh, I, we, this entire police department is invested in this cause, and we continue to appreciate the continued support from our city council and our council members on this important issue. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. I'm gonna go here and what, um, and I'm just gonna, well, I'm sorry. I just wanted to um, ask everyone if we could all agree to stay a little later. I try to end things on time when I grab you, but if I can keep you all till 7.15. And then I'm just gonna ask folks to be as brief as you can about, um, and I'm really interested in your recommendations. You know, if there's anything you wanna affirm or something you wanna uh, tell us to do. Thank you, Sherry. Sure, um, so I was really pleased to hear um, about the proposal around a full implementation of a children's advocacy center model. Um, what I really appreciated hearing from Dr. Sturm was this idea that everything that happens in the development of the center, the facility, the personnel, the approach is really to reduce re-traumatization of children. And I think that's such a critical uh, piece of what you're doing. Um, uh, most of my training as a psychologist actually took place at UC Davis Medical Center where I worked in the Care Diagnostic and Treatment Center, which was a children's advocacy center model where we had um, the facility that was able to do the SART exams in a way in which we would not re-traumatize children. And adjacent to that were all of the, the services and supports, including behavioral health services. Um, so as I think about the implementation or the possible impl implementation in Santa Clara County um, from the behavioral health perspective, it would be really, um, I think, important to think about the way in which we could leverage those resources to support children um, who are experiencing um, significant trauma. And um, the other thing I wanted to mention is the county has adopted a trauma-informed and healing framework for the county. And so to the extent possible that we can actually leverage some of the work that is taking place there to really think together about how we reduce trauma 
in our systems, in our approaches, I think will be really important as we go forward in this conversation. I do know that there's a commitment from our board and all of the members of our cross-agency services team to ensure that that's happening system-wide and county-wide. Um, and I'm, I was very pleased to hear Chief Garcia talk about the work around uh, trauma training for his department. Our trauma transform team has been um, very excited to be engaged in those conversations about the way in which we can work with law enforcement uh, to um, be able to help infuse these trauma-informed principles in all of our systems. So thank you. Thanks for that. Paul? So just a brief comment. Uh, prior to being part of the delivery system here in Santa Clara County, I spent 13 years as a public health director in Ventura County. Uh, when this Child Advocacy Center came to light, I was actually very surprised that we did not have such a coordinated effort around child abuse. Um, this is a no-brainer. You have the commitment of the health system to be at the table, to come up with solutions, and to, to continue in this partnership, in this effort. Thank you. I'm gonna go to, yeah, go ahead, Casey, and then I'll uh, go back this way. So just briefly, uh, one other recommendation I wanted to make is we haven't talked about housing. And I think when we talk about child sexual abuse, the reality that most of the perpetrators are known to the victims, we're talking about husbands, fathers, boyfriends, and we're talking about removing an income from the home when that person is perpetrated. And we need to have housing available to these families. I can think of several cases off the top of my head where we had mothers now supporting three, four, and five children living out of their cars, living out of people's homes because there isn't sufficient shelter. They don't qualify or they may, they, they can get into the domestic violence shelters. The agencies are amazing and will pull all kinds of strings to help these families. But when we think of recommendations and the flexible funding for our nonprofit partners, we really need to consider adding money for housing for these families. Thank you. Anybody else on this side? If I may, um, I already said what I needed to say, but I think that we haven't paid enough attention to workforce development, and Sherry alluded to it a bit earlier, but workforce development in a community of learning approach, looking at systems and what all of us are investing in around staff development and training, but also our partners and our families, and really doing a, an assertive approach where we come together one single funding stream, and what is the model of training we're going to do? We've been working very uh, closely with the Behavioral Health Department on trauma-informed services, but how do we outreach to the neighborhoods? How do we really engage in a broad spectrum uh, development of, um, of a comprehensive understanding of the impact of trauma, but the comprehensive understanding of what our children who are victims are really living with every single day? I was amazed at the data. Um, I believe Daniel showed it, where the line stays has stayed constant the last six years, and then in some cases increased in the number of children who have been victimized. So it speaks to the awareness and the understanding, but the system that supports ongoing services. So I would, I would put a stake in the ground that First Five would be loving to work, be honored to work with everybody here in how we can really develop that system of care and what we can do with our funding to add value to the gaps in services especially around the prevention strategy, but working with our partners in the county on the intervention and treatment long-term. And then most and lastly is that data for impact. How do we come together and really be able to show this dais, this community, when we work together, what changes we can make and what impact we can have? And I'd be interested in looking at that with our evaluation dollars as well. Thank you. Anybody else? DA? I don't see anybody else reaching, but no? Anybody else over here? Dave? Say thank you. Go ahead, and then I'll, I'm gonna wrap up with some strategies. Um, let me just say um, a thank you. Um, I particularly wanna thank um, Supervisor Chavez's uh, staff. staff uh, to my staff, where are they? Lesser degree, own. my own staff. Yeah, our staff, thank you for all your good work, you guys. Uh, <clears throat> council members were talking about having um, done some convenings uh, in the past and continue to do those and it's um, it, it's you're doing a terrific job leading the way as, as the chair of the committee and I think it's also terrific that the uh, the county 
system from the clerk's office to the county executive's office and so forth staff these hearings uh, just as they would a, a board of supervisors meeting or any other uh, serious uh, public hearing because obviously these are the most serious of issues. Um, I want to say two substantive things very quickly um, and I apologize for if anyone didn't hear why I was late but I was coming from another government meeting in San Francisco with the Metropolitan Transportation Commission trying to get here uh, through traffic so I put my bolt to the test and didn't quite make it. Um, <laughs> it made it, it made it, but not um, fully within the law, Chief. <laughs> I, I, I want to, um, I just want to say I think there's still some confusion into my, in my mind in terms of the correlation of data and I think I would like just as, as one individual elected official to get really, really clear on that, especially someone who re represents the east side along with other, some other elected officials here. So I'm not really clear, I'm hearing a lot about unreported, unsubstantiated versus what is reported and was, what is substantiated. So I'm a little bit unclear as to where, as to the frequency of victimization and where that's actually occurring versus where it's actually getting reported and showing up, which I think could be two different things or it could be the same, I don't know. It's just, it's just an issue um, and if I miss that in the presentations, uh, I apologize but someone could reach out to me offline and help me. I'm sure, I'm sure there's more data out there. The second um, thing I wanna say is I have been um, honestly just kind of stunned and taken aback the last couple of years at, at a couple of, of areas of concern where we where we have so much work to do in terms of, of helping people navigate. Um, just basic navigation is, is, is absolutely um, falling short systemically. It's, it's not, uh, I'm not indicting any department or individual or, or anyone else. In fact, I'll take my share of, of the blame for not perhaps recognizing it earlier as someone who's been here for 10 and a half years. Um, but we have a huge challenge out there in areas like behavioral health, especially with younger people and families, clearly in, in this area of victimization, in terms of people just knowing where to go. There was a speaker who was talking about having a single point. And I'm not sure the old model would work today for other reasons, including the need to segregate youth and some other things that we've learned um, in that process. Um, but it's a problem and those two areas that I mentioned are obviously tethered. You know, we, we're, we're seeing the fallout from victimization that, that goes untreated, if you will, to suicide um, and, and other really serious mental health problems that take place later, either for that same victim or other members of the family, or in some cases, even the perpetrator. So um, I, I, I suspect having some lived experience in my own extended family with behavioral health issues and trying to navigate that system that um, we, just, we just have a lot of work to do to make that clear, simple, you know, basic. Um, and and I, I, I would like to join you, Supervisor Chavez, and the administration here to, to try to make some progress with that over the next year. Thank Great. you. Thank you. So um, I want to um, just again say thank you to everybody who came, everybody who presented today. This is you gave us some really thoughtful ideas, and and um, and then just to the dais, I, I'll make some recommendations, and then just talk a little bit about process. I, I think that probably the most important. Um, one of the most important elements I heard today was just how we do better coordination because it's really hard to, it's hard to know how big the problem is if we're not all talking to each other. And so I wanna just think about that from a more uh, systemic uh, way. I think um, some of the prevention, we're gonna get an opportunity to talk about because I wanna spend a hearing on prevention and dive into um, housing and other um, opportunities and think a little bit more about how we shape that. So we'll, we'll come back with that um, shaped up. What our next steps are gonna be is we're gonna take all of the recommendations that came, and we heard the main one. I just want you to know we, we were listening. Um, but all of the recommendations that came, came to us, we'll um, 
bring them to Children's Family Seniors Committee so that we can do an assessment with our team because we want to get feedback from the staff. And I think, you know, Paul and all the other systems, we really want to get your input. So we'll have a conversation um, at Children's Family Seniors and then we'll bring recommendations to the full board. Um, we're going to bring them, I think, in pieces. And the reason for that is that um, I'm really excited to see our Office of gender uh, violence prevention here, um, that we have a lot of activities that we've been moving on a whole number of issues. One of them is we were doing some work around the Joint Foster Youth Task Force, and what I was just reminded of today around differential response as an example, that that, um, that the um, that we had a conversation, uh, had a, a hearing about this, and one of the things that I was reminded of is that we get so many calls into our, our CAN Center and a lot of them we, we don't respond to because they're so low level. And those are the exact ones I think we need to respond to through the mechanism you're talking about. So in any case, we've got a lot of pieces that are moving and we, I think we need to knit them together a little bit. Everybody who came and who signed in, you'll get invited to that and we'll be able to access anything that we produce and be able to give your thoughts or feedback to it too. It really helps us to hear the, the what really does and doesn't work about the way we think about the world and I'm, you know, I'm humbled to say we we do really need to get better, and I expect that that's what we're going to spend a lot of time talking about. From a timeline perspective, um, I think that probably we'll bring this to um, Children's Family Senior Seniors Committee in January, um, and mostly to give our staff time to take a look at whatever we draft up. Any thoughts about that or what I just said? And. We'll send something out so you can all give us your feedback because that's we, that wouldn't be okay without it. The follow up on the prevention um, side of this, I think we're also are we doing that in January also, Maya? January February timeframe. So we'll make sure we reach out to all of you about that as well. So we don't need to take any formal action. We heard a, heard a lot from everyone. I want to take our last two public speakers uh, that are under public comment, and then um, we will close today's hearing. So Catherine Campbell and Roberta Fitzpatrick. Thank you for this public comment time. Uh, Catherine Campbell with California Protective Parents Association, and I will give you our URL <coughs> because it has so much information on it. I want you all to visit it, caprotectiveparents.org. Um, first off, it takes a village to dismiss abuse, and it takes a village to prevent it. Um, the Quincy Solution is a book by Barry Goldstein. I recommend everybody read it because if we are not holding our perpetrators accountable, then this continues. Um, we shown two films in the um, in this uh, area, in this um, district, um, the trafficking film, which was great, and the resilience film. And um, I do ask that we now show What Doesn't Kill Me, which I know you have a copy of to preview. Um, Jennifer Freyd is at Stanford right now. She is someone who came up with DARVO, um, institutional betrayal, which is what we heard a lot about tonight. And we're not the only ones stuck there. This is like a problem across the world. And we're at a precipice of change. And she came up with institutional courage. And all of that needs to be understood and read. And we need to look at her Wharton speak, uh, talk um, with her speaking. She needs to be invited to the, um, the symposium. She should be our main speaker, if um, I may say so. And um, lacking really um, why we're not looking at the 86% of our children, the unsubstantiated, is because it's a norm not to believe. It's our society, even though it's in a best interest of a child, children have no money, so they have no voice. They don't have any voting rights. And so we are um, a culture that dismisses, and Nadine Burke Harris will have an initiation on December 5th for ACE Awareness Initiative, which will she will start doing ACEs everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Roberta Fitzpatrick. <clears throat> As a retired teacher, I was struck by how nobody really said very much about children in classrooms. And teachers need to be informed about signs, not just as mandated reporters, but to really be able to notice when children are acting out and start not blaming, 
but finding the reasons and uh, then reporting in, within the school to start with. The other thing is I really believe that you need a connection between family court and children's services and abuse because too often children are sent to live with their abusers. More, most of the time, if women report abuse or report, report some kind of um, concern, they're the ones that lose, especially since usually they don't have the money. They don't have the attorneys. And our little Alicia is a prime example. Many other children have been murdered in the same circumstances since she died. Nobody has changed a law. Nobody has done anything to make it different for these kids or for the mothers who are usually victims of domestic violence to start with. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta. That is a somber but appropriate note to end on. Um, one last thing I wanted to say, thank you to Frank. He gets all of my hearings, I apologize. Have a good, good night, everybody. Thank you.